Hi everyone, I'm Susan Birch and welcome to another A Health Detective podcast. And today's guest is Dr. Robert Wolf, who I am introduce as an expert in protein and amino acids. I'm currently reading his book, A Guide to Amino Acid and Protein Nutrition, Essential Amino Acids for Everyone. He calls this the EASE program, which we will talk a lot more about today. I highly recommend this book. Dr. Wolf has got an incredible bio. I've never seen anyone with a bio with 44 pages before. And this represents his very incredible life's work. He's got over 500 peer reviewed published papers and another about 143 review articles and text chapters. So I think it's fair to say he might know a little bit about protein and amino acids. Dr. Wolf, I feel really privileged to have you here today. And thank you for sharing information that's all going to help us better understand why it's so imperative to pay attention to the protein and amino acids in our diets. So thanks for being here. Well, I'm glad to, glad to hear that you're enjoying the book. And the purpose I wrote the book for was to uh, help inform <coughs> inform consumers what uh, some of the basic facts about nutrition, particularly related to amino acid and protein metabolism are, and uh, so that, so that uh, people can make an informed decision about how they approach their uh, nutrition. Yeah, it's a really great book and I do recommend it. I, I don't understand with all those papers why I hadn't really, I probably have read your research, but I probably hadn't really looked at the authors and, and names. And, and for some reason, I was reading something um, <coughs> months ago and sort of looked at the authors and and check some of you out. And then I, and then I, you know, it was just luck would have it. I found you and found your book and went down that bit of rabbit hole and contacted you and you, you're living in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah, I, I think that it's, uh, you know, what you said is, it's kind of a, a, a I found that for uh, many years as a, a kind of uh, felt like, uh, of course, it's, only figure speech now of stacking papers up in the library in the sense that if it didn't translate to something that uh, could actually be useful to uh, the average people, then, you know, that, that it was really just kind of an academic exercise. And I think it was probably about, oh, five, maybe 10 years ago that I began to, uh, to recognize the fact that unless it translates to something that you can put on the kitchen table and, and regular people can drink and understand why they're, uh, doing that, that, that there really isn't any great uh, translational benefit to research per se. So that's really been my, mess, my uh, mission for the last 10 or 15 years is to continue to do sophisticated research and uh, getting at the nuts and bolts of protein metabolism and, and, and uh, molecular mechanisms and so forth. But really, the, that my main goal is to try to translate some of that into understandable terms that people can really utilize in their daily lives. Yeah, thank you. Can you tell us, just give us a little bit of background about how you got into this kind of research? I think you were an athlete. I did a bit of bit of internet stalking. I think you had athletic <laughs> um, tendencies yeah. or, or, or ambitions. Yeah, well, uh, and the, the system in the US is a little different than here. And uh, the United States, the universities, uh, have the main, the main athletic teams other than the professional leagues. And uh, I, for most of my life up through graduating from university, I was a basketball player and I, I played uh, the University of California and, and played, I, I guess you could say well enough to be drafted into the National Basketball Association as well. But, uh, but I, I went to graduate school instead. And, and I also was always interested in running and, and took up running when I was in graduate school due to a couple of friends that were marathon runners and, and really have done that sort of training for my entire life. I'm 75 now and I, I completed about 66, 66 marathons and most of them under two hours and 30 minutes. So it's been a pretty serious uh, effort and, and other types of athletics as well. So I, I come into the whole general field with a background of, of quite a bit of experience and exercise, but but initially, that really wasn't the thing that uh, that uh, got me going on this. I started off as a uh, 
after graduate school as an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and working specifically in the Charters Hospital for Severely Burned Children. And the, message, the, message, the uh, mission there was to take severely burned children and uh, of course not only help them survive but also to uh, enable them to re-enter life in a reasonable way. And, and, and in, in those studies, uh, it turns out that in a lot of, and this is in the 1970s, a lot of the research was done in animals, but there was really no way to de develop appropriate nutritional metabolic approaches for severely burned children in any sort of animal model. And so I worked very hard to develop methods that would enable us to quantify metabolic reactions in uh, human patients. And those studies eventually evolved into understanding that the major problem that these kids had was a deficiency in the ability to make new proteins in the body, both related to wound healing as well as in particular, uh, which is a little unexpected, was the muscle uh, protein. And, and that even kids that survived huge burns, 70 or 80 percent, third degree burns, uh, you know, the, the wound healing was ultimately adequate, but they lost so much muscle mass and strength that they really could barely function. And uh, so it was uh, the start of kind of a long journey to figure out how to overcome what they call anabolic resistance, meaning that the normal nutrition that you would, uh, a normal person would benefit from in terms of developing and maintaining their muscle mass is uh, not that these kids are resistant to that normal nutritional effect. And, and it required uh, a long path of, of understanding the molecular basis for this insulin resistance and how to overcome it that led me to a variety of circumstances, recognizing that this same mechanism is operative in many aspects of our lives, particularly most commonly in aging, where uh, the same nutritional intake in an older person uh, isn't as effective in maintaining the metabolic state as it is in a younger person. It's true in all sorts of chronic disease situations like chronic obstruction, pulmonary disease, and heart failure, and, and a number of cases in which we've studied. So that uh, so my uh, research took me in a, in a variety of directions that seemingly were uh, multifactorial, but they all, in the end, kind of focused back on the role of muscle and both controlling metabolic uh, balance in the body is not only through a functional standpoint, but through other interactions in the body, such as neurotransmitters, wound healing, immune function, and all the variety of uh, actions that dietary protein plays a role in. So, so that brought me <clears throat> to the point of, uh, of really focusing on how to translate some of that information to formulations that would benefit uh, uh, everyday people. And you know, that's kind of where I am now of, of trying to translate uh, some of these sophisticated metabolic studies that were particularly targeting uh, severe illness, critical care, and so forth, and translate that into a more general application to, uh, to people that just want to have good nutrition and maintain uh, their health. Oh, that's, that's excellent. And you are a founder, or you're part of the amino company, which produces a range of amino acids. Supplement? Yes, uh, that's right. And uh, the, uh, I work part time as a uh, uh, maintaining my lab at the University of Arkansas Medical School, which is particularly focused on aging. I'm in the largest geriatric clinic in the United States, but also as the chief scientific officer for the amino company. And as I said, uh, that that we found that that it, it's really necessary to uh, actually translate this research to products for people to ever get their hands on them. And uh, I think that, that one of the things that's really limited uh, improvement in nutritional health has been the fact that there's this dichotomy between the academics and the businessmen, and uh, that there's a kind of a black mark on any academic that, uh, that goes into the uh, uh, you know, industrial or the co commercial sphere. But the fact is that, uh, that without being able to get hands on some of the products that, that uh, follow from uh, this really research, help. it really doesn't do any good. And, and, and I've now developed uh, 14 different patents on different formulations of essential amino acids designed for particular 
medical uh, or, or other problems. And uh, four of those are currently being marketed by the Immunico uh, brand, but uh, there are others in the pipeline as well. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how the, the two things have gone. And it's important for your uh, listeners to understand that I do have this commercial interest in essential amino acids. So uh, uh, I would, you know, that always has to uh, be interpreted, uh, taken into account and interpreting what someone says. But at the same time, I just explain that the reason that I got into the commercial aspect was that uh, that the Shriners Hospital is a, it's, it seems like a, a little bit of a deviation, but but I'll just stay with me and I'll, I'll get to the point. The Shriners Hospital is a fantastic philanthropy that, that pays for all the medical care for, from start to finish for these burned children. And one of their philanthropic uh, aspects is that you that they that if you work there you can't patent anything because they felt like this really should be uh, free to the world. But the problem is that uh, for years I spent time traveling around uh, the world talking about the work we did with nutrition and metabolism, and then uh, people in the audience said, "Well, that's great. Where can we get this?" And I'd have to say, "Well, you can't get it because no company would uh, ever." go to the energy and, and investment of selling a product that didn't have a patent in the medical field. And that's why I moved ultimately to the University of Arkansas because I recognized that without patents and without a commercial uh, expression of this, nobody has access to it. So that was uh, really the motivation for me to try to, uh, to, to extend my research into the commercial area. It wasn't initially that that would be my job, but uh, I realized that that's the only way we really can get uh, the translation of basic research into a public forum. Well, I'm quite happy to share about your products because I think anything that can help people improve their health um, is really, really important. And I went online to see how easy it would be to buy a couple of bottles. And I did that the other day um, after I spoke to you, so or after I emailed you, so yeah, I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to trying those. And yeah, hopefully the shipping will get a little better. It's been pretty slow uh, in the yeah. last. Uh, uh, I just sent the one day delivery to uh, the U.S. of the just a document, and it took uh, three weeks to get there. So uh, I think that we're still getting uh, equilibrium. But I, it's great to hear. I didn't know that that was available. I'm not really involved in sales, but I'm glad to hear that you're able to order it and get it here. Well, quite often we can't get products from the US here, you know, they're not available. So I was really pleased. Um, I've been notified that it's shipped already. So oh, I'll, good. So I'll, I'll let you know. And see well, yeah, I'll be interested how, how you like it. Get here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let, maybe we could start at the beginning. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have a reasonable understanding of protein or maybe not. But perhaps we could start at the beginning and talk about protein and amino acids and essential, you know, maybe essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids and just, you know, set some groundwork. Sure. Start. Yeah, well, I think everybody knows that the, uh, pro the, the our macronutrients in the diet are carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Protein is really the only component of the diet there's a, a real dietary requirement for. You need a little bit of fat, of essential fatty acids. But fundamentally, you can live without any carbohydrate and almost with no fat in your diet, but you can't live without protein. It's the only essential component of the diet. Now, the dietary protein is composed of about uh, 20 protein, 20 amino acids. Those are the components of the dietary protein. Some unusual amino acids may be in uh, obscure proteins, but fundamentally, there are 20 uh, amino acids and dietary protein, which coincide with the amino acids that make up the protein in the body. Uh, the body is uh, largely composed of various proteins, over 3,000 proteins in the body. And the proteins in the body are in a continual state of turnover, meaning that they're continually being broken down and then resynthesized. And this is this protein turnover aspect is crucial for well-functioning proteins in the body because the proteins that have kind of served their purpose and not functioning as well. If you think of muscle protein, for example, the ability to contract the muscle fibers uh, 
declines as the, the uh, mechanisms for those fibers uh, become damaged. So that you're taking away the damaged proteins and replacing them with new proteins so that are functioning better. And this, this so-called protein turnover is really the heart of why you need a constant supply of dietary protein. Because as a protein is broken down in the body, it can't all be reincorporated. The amino acids that are released can't all be incorporated back into the protein. Some are oxidized and, and discarded by the body so that you have to replace a certain amount of the amino acids that are released from protein breakdown so that the rate of protein synthesis can match the rate of protein breakdown. That's where the dietary amino acids come in and specifically the essential amino acids. Out of these dietary amino acids, there are 11 that aren't really required in the diet on a regular basis because they can be produced in the body by metabolic reactions. But there are nine amino acids called the essential amino acids that are not produced in the body by any molecular mechanisms and they have to be consumed. And there are dietary requirements that are well agreed upon by both the WHO as well as the National Academy of Science in the US uh, requirements for specific um, amounts of amino acids, essential amino acids that have to be eaten each day. And in fact, the, uh, the amount and profile of the amino acids and dietary protein is the basis for the Food and Agricultural Organization uh, classification of protein quality. So the more uh, dense a uh, dietary protein is with essential amino acids and particularly relating to the profile dictated by the various requirements for the individual amino acids uh, gives a score that can directly reflect the dietary quality of the protein that's being eaten. So that we have this, uh, this situation where the new proteins have to have all of the amino acids available to them to be able to be produced. And yet nine of those can't be produced in the body. So you have to eat those on a regular basis to maintain, to, so that new proteins can be produced. Otherwise, if you don't eat sufficient amount of essential amino acids, then you'll get a breakdown of protein that's not matched by a corresponding amount of protein synthesis and gradually lose uh, the function of the, of the proteins, in, including uh, impaired muscle function in particular. So that, uh, uh, you know, that's kind of the background uh, mm -hmm. for the evolution of essential amino acid uh, uh, formulations, because, uh, uh, well, I think, I, I think let's just take a break if you have some questions there, and then we can go on as to what the point of the essential amino acid supplementation is. Great. So you've talked a lot about muscle and Basically, muscle is provides a reservoir of amino acids for the body to use to incorporate into making all those 3,000 proteins that are in the body. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I think it's the, the way to think about it is this, and that is there's a requirement for amino acids for every tissue and organ in the body, and that has to continually be uh, available, and it's available through the plasma or the blood amino acids that circulate. So in the fed state, that's not really a problem because the amino acids are coming from the digested protein and they're, they're coming into the blood and the skin and the heart and the intestines, the liver, they can all extract what they need from that blood, which has ultimately been derived from the dietary intake. However, we spend a lot of the time of the day in the, what we call the post-absorptive state, meaning there's no absorption of amino acids going on. But yet the demand for protein synthesis in all of these various tissues and organs persists. We can't just stop the production of new skin as old skin is broken down or within a day or two of not eating, you would have no, no barrier to the body. And that's true for all these other tissues. But the only tissue that has enough uh, spare amino acids to afford to release some into the blood so that these other essential tissues can continue functioning is the muscle. So the muscle uh, in the fasted state or the post-absorptive state breaks has a net breakdown of, amino, of protein that releases amino acids into the blood. Those amino acids are now available to, be, to maintain the protein synthesis and all the other tissues and organs in the body that don't really have the capacity to store 
uh, extra amino acids. Then when the, when the meal is eaten, this loss of muscle protein that has occurred to maintain the blood levels when there's no food being absorbed is sort of paid back so that the uh, uh, bulk of what you eat actually replaces the amino acids that have been lost from muscle in the fasted state. So we have this muscle playing a very central role in maintaining the blood amino acid level to maintain availability for all the various processes from production of neurotransmitters, uh, immune function, heart function, all of these various physiological functions that require continual production of protein is only able to main, be maintained because of the breakdown of muscle protein in the fasted state, which is repaid in the fed state. So that's of course, as an athlete, I'm always interested in muscle. That was the origin. I, I, none of this metabolic stuff really was uh, of, of concern to me, but it, but it just became evident as, the, as, as we saw over so many different circumstances that muscle plays a key role in survival and resistance to, uh, to a number of metabolic and, and clinical problems that I became so much more focused on the importance of muscle overall as a an important uh, component of the diet relative to maintaining homeostasis. And I'd like to get into talking about muscle a bit more. But my next question is about the triggering amino acids. So, you know, I've talked a lot about leucine. So when we're eating protein, we've got to get enough leucine in with each meal in order for muscle protein synthesis to actually occur. So I've got a couple of questions. Are there other triggering amino acids for other um, functions like, you know, brain function or, or, or gut proteins? And can you just explain a bit more about why it's so important that we have the right ratios of essential amino acids all at the same time? Sure. Well, you're right about leucine does have a dual role. Uh, if we think about muscle uh, specifically, muscle, the, the uh, leucine is the most predominant uh, essential amino acid in muscle protein. So just as a, as a precursor uh, for protein synthesis, you need extra leucine as compared to some of the other essential amino acids, simply because there's more leucine in the uh, uh, muscle protein than other essential amino acids. In addition to that, and maybe it's related uh, in some way that uh, leucine can play a role in triggering the whole response by activating the molecular mechanisms that are involved in enabling the muscle protein to be produced at an increased rate. So, so leucine is an important protein, amino acid, essential amino acid. And when we think about mixtures, a lot of people will ask me, well, what's the difference between the branch chain amino acids or leucine versus essential amino acids? And the answer is there is no difference. Leucine and the other branch chain amino acids, which are isoleucine and valine, are essential amino acids. So there, any formulation that of, of essential amino acids will include those amino acids. And generally speaking, leucine will be the most predominant uh, amino acid because uh, not only is it needed in a higher proportion, but also of this mechanism of activating the whole process of protein synthesis. So. Uh, so that's, that's all relative to, to, uh, to muscle, but there are other functions, as I said, of, uh, of amino acids. And uh, one of the key functions is as precursors of neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitters that we're most familiar with are dopamine and serotonin, where serotonin makes you feel sleepy and, and fatigued and dopamine uh, gets you kind of jacked up and, and excited and high focus. And so if we're getting up in the morning, we want the dopamine to be activated. If we're going to bed at night, we want the serotonin to predominate. This ratio between the two is crucial and is directly influenced by the availability of the amino, specific amino acids that are precursors of those two compounds. So that, that's, uh, that's, an important thing, that's an important concept in terms of the overall balance. If we just give one amino acid or two or three individual amino acids, we throw off this balance that's required for maintaining the proper availability of the amino acids for the production of, of neurotransmitters. We have other functions that uh, amino acids are involved with as well. The blood flow in different tissues and organs is largely controlled by a chemical called nitric oxide. And that's a precursor, that's again, 
produced from essential um, uh, amino acids, and so that uh, so that the main maintenance of uh, normal blood pressure is related to the availability of the precursors to produce nitric oxide, and this is why we see uh, uh, a lot of data supporting the reduction in hypertension with adequate essential amino acid intake because of maintaining the production of nitric oxide. So there are a whole variety of, uh, uh, of actions. And, and I think that uh, my general principle has been because of all of these, it's, you know, everybody has that tends to get focused on, uh, on their particular interests and not think about the whole body. <laughs> and that, that, that every year we learn more and more about specific functions and that, uh, that maintaining a, 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 an appropriate balance with all of the essential amino acids, I think should be a fundamental uh, guiding principle uh, that isn't dependent on the action at one specific tissue or another, but enables the uh, a multitude of, 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 of uh, requirements to be met by reasonable approach without uh, you know, skewing it with an excessive amount of one amino acid versus the other. Quite a few questions come out of that. I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the importance of protein and maybe, uh, maybe just a little bit about why exercise is important, you know, because protein, prov muscle pr provides, sorry, did I say muscle or protein? <laughs> I want to talk a bit more about muscle and the importance of exercise and maintaining muscle and you know how muscle is kind of a sink for our for our glucose and 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 those yeah, processes exactly muscle not only I, I described the central role of muscle in protein metabolism in the body by maintaining the uh the uh uh blood levels but there's really a variety of functions that particularly as we get older become more and more upfront in, in our concern uh uh, as, as you get older, one of the things that is very common is an in, in, a decrease in the ability to clear glucose from the blood, ultimately uh, leading to type 2 diabetes. And muscle is the major site of clearance of glucose from the bloodstream. So that uh, proper functioning muscle and an adequate muscle mass is quite important in maintaining the uh, uh, normal glucose level. Uh, another aspect which we don't think about, but uh, explains the fact that higher dietary protein intake supports bone function is not just the fact that there is protein synthesis involved in the production of new bone, but the strength and integrity of bone is in part uh, ensues from the strength of uh, the torque put on those bones from muscular contraction. So that someone that's lost a lot of their muscle mass and not really doing any exercise will, will coincide the uh, loss of bone strength and function will coincide with that because they're not getting the torque put on the muscle. I think that, uh, that uh, there are so many different aspects of muscle function, but I think also I would not diminish the importance of the obvious and that's in maintaining physical function. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, you know, working in a, in a large geriatric clinic, I see on a daily basis, people that have passed the threshold of loss of muscle mass to where they really have struggled getting out of a chair and that and, and doing other activities of daily living that really uh, have a tremendous je uh, je jeopardize in a tremendous way the quality of life. And, uh, you know, you don't notice it so much when you're in the 20s and 30s, it's not really a big factor. But uh, I can tell you that when you get to 60s and 70s, if you've ignored uh, uh, taking care of the muscle, that this loss of uh, physical function really becomes the most pressing uh, factor leading to a poor quality of life. And, and in that context, you can only do so much with diet alone. The muscle, uh, when, it, when you do exercise in the muscle, it's the same mechanism as with the high leucine, that it activates the process of protein synthesis, but without the precursors without the amino acids, extra amino acids given, nothing really happens. There's very little effect of exercise alone if you don't eat adequate protein and amino acids. The two things work synergistically where exercise primes the muscle so that you get a better response to the essential amino acids that you take. 
um, and the two things work together, if you take just amino acids alone, it'll help with your muscle a little bit. And the same thing with the exercise alone, the two together give a much bigger response than the sum of the two parts because you've activated the molecular process and now you're providing the, uh, the, the components of the protein that's gonna be produced so that you can really get a much enhanced uh, muscle protein turnover and improve the quality of muscle. And, and we've shown in a variety of studies and in all sorts of conditions that, that we can improve muscle strength uh, very rapidly with just modest exercise combined with uh, uh, adequate essential amino acid intake. So I think, the, I think the message there from both of us is even if you're getting older, just get out there and do a bit of exercise. Do you think a bit of resistance training? I know you're a runner and a sprinter, but a little bit of resistance training as well for people. And it doesn't have to be hardcore bodybuilding. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, they say that about running because I continue to run. I'm still running, but uh when I turned about 72 or 73, I, uh, you know, and I always felt like, well, uh, I should probably do some upper body resistance mm -hmm. exercise, but the legs, I mean, I run a lot of miles. So, you know, why would I need that? And, and yet it's interesting that the uh, aerobic exercise alone does not prevent the muscle loss, both in mass and function. And I started doing um, uh, resistance exercise pretty rigorously and it's made a real turnaround, I feel. So, I mean, I was getting to the point just that I could run five miles, but had trouble getting out of a chair. And now I feel so much better combining aerobic and resistance exercise. So I think that I really wish that I had uh, taken up the resistance exercise, uh, you know, a long time ago, but uh, that, that horse has kind of left the barn. Uh, all I could do is move forward. And I, I, I would totally agree with you that, uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, gut wrenching, uh, you know, eyes popping out, weightlifting, but uh, resistance exercise really gives you something that you don't get just with the aerobic exercise. Yeah, uh, I think that's really important. And I just want to say you look really great anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> you look pretty good. You're 70, 75, I think you said you were. Yeah. 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 Everything's relative. I mean, I, the the older you get, the better everybody else looks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the next question, the next you know, basic question for people would be, where do they get? Where's the best source of these amino acids, dietary wise, to start off with? Yeah. Um, I think that, that it's important to touch on why the, this is kind of related to the essential amino acid supplements. They, uh, the animal proteins are the, the best source of the essential amino acids. Uh, when we look at the scoring of muscle quality, B protein, uh, whey, and if we're looking at supplements, whey protein, eggs, uh, dairy products, have much higher quality scores than uh, plant-based proteins. Um, that being said, that isn't to say that you can't maintain uh, an adequate amount of essential amino acid intake with a plant-based diet, but it's much harder um, because you need to, to meet the requirements for all of the essential amino acids. And the problem, the twofold problems with the plant-based proteins, one is that the density of uh, amino acids in the protein isn't very high so that you have to eat a fair amount of calories to get an adequate amount of dietary protein. But the second point is that a lot of the plants are deficient in one or more specific essential amino acids so that uh, you may be getting plenty of dietary protein according to the requirements for dietary protein, but you're not getting one, for example, lysine is one of the amino acids that's quite commonly rate limiting so that if you're limited by one, then the others that you take really aren't providing much benefit. The thing that I think is important to recognize is that there's no dietary protein source that comes without other calories associated with it. So one of the health issues, which uh, we, it's a, would be a sidebar to go into it, but people are concerned about whether rightly so or not, it's debatable, but, but in eating meat that you, uh, uh, eat a significant amount of, uh, of saturated fat that, it, that goes along with the meat. 
uh, and eating enough plant-based protein to, uh, to maintain the essential amino acid requirements, you're getting quite a bit of carbohydrate as well. Uh, and so that you have a caloric intake of either fat or carbohydrate that is absolutely part of the dietary protein food source. Uh, the advantage of using the essential amino acid requirements is that they can be tailored for specific conditions or situations. And they don't, they don't in essence, provide any extra calories to speak of at all because there's no fat, there's no carbohydrate in the profile targets the exact mechanisms for protein synthesis. So they don't even contain non-essential amino acids that would be used for producing urea and, and ammonia and have to be excreted. So that the efficiency of utilization of pure essential amino acids is uh, very close to 100%, meaning that if you take uh, five grams of essential amino acids, it's producing five grams of, of protein in the body, which is about three times as effective as the highest form of highest quality of protein, and that being an isolated whey protein. But if we look at food sources of dietary protein, it's maybe six times as effective if we look at per calorie ingested. So, that, so if you're taking a vegan diet, for example, you're gonna be low on essential amino acids, uh, but that can be easily remedied by taking an essential amino acid uh, supplement, which can be produced all, all naturally as well as uh, 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 from vegan sources so that, uh, so that it's, it's, it's certainly possible to eat any sort of dietary protein that you want, but at the same time recognize that if you're eating a diet that is very heavy in meat, that you're eating a lot of saturated fat with that. If you're eating a, a vegan diet, then uh, you're probably getting an insufficient amount of, of uh, essential amino acids, particularly uh, as you get older, because the requirements do rise as you get older. And that uh, in both of these circumstances, you can, can make up the balance by taking a, uh, a relatively small amount of essential amino acids that may have no more than 40 or 50 calories for the total dosing and provide the, the sort of metabolic kick of four or five times as much uh, protein in a, in a food source. Mm. So what you're saying there really is that the energy in our diet, the, the calories in our diet really are coming from carbohydrates and or fats. And although protein has is a calorie source, it's not it goes through a different mechanism in the body and it's not really you, it's not stored as energy in the body like carbohydrates and fat are stored. And if people are wanting to lose weight, they need to reduce the energy content of their diet. And unfortunately, that often means that they're reducing their protein content at the same time. And so these essential amino acids can be very helpful in um, maintaining um, that level without that added calorie intake. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you phrased it perfectly. I think that the thing that's uh, just one little extra point relative to that is that this process of protein turnover that's fueled by your dietary protein and amino acids is an energy dependent process. So that even though you're eating four, four calories per gram of protein, or per gram of essential amino acid, you're stimulating the uh, metabolic rate by about one, so that the, uh, the total caloric intake is less than even as advertised because you're, you're increasing your metabolic rate. Mm. So to that end, we've done three or four studies now using essential amino acid supplements in uh, caloric restriction weight loss and showing that with the exact same amount of calories that, uh, in two groups, one uh, taking a traditional meal replacement as the primary caloric source and the other an essential amino acid based meal product, that the weight loss is the same because the calories are the same, but that the uh, maintenance of muscle mass is significantly higher when you eat the, uh, dietary, the essential amino acid uh, aspect uh, um, muscle, the essential amino acid meal replacement as opposed to the traditional meal replacement predicated entirely on carbohydrate, fat, and protein. So that uh, the way you expressed it is exactly right, that 
that really the carb and fat are where the, the calories are coming from for the most part. Not more than 10% of your energy intake is gonna be comprised of your dietary protein. Mm -hmm. So just another question about that. Do we, what other micronutrients are required in the processing and in the using of amino acids? Are they, do they require, you know, vitamins and minerals and trace elements for their, you know, ability to be converted into other proteins and for their function? Well, that's a great point. And I think that that's uh, one of the reasons in my book that I stress the importance of eating a well-balanced diet that, uh, that uh, you know, people with short bowel syndrome can live for years and years on uh, free amino acids and uh, glucose intravenously. So we know it can be done, but in those patients, you have to give them uh, a whole, the whole gamut of required nutrients along with it, which are not present in, uh, an isolated uh, format of, of essential amino acids, so that uh, so that that's where the importance of of, of using these essential amino acid uh, formulations as supple dietary supplements, assuming that you're getting all of the nutrients you need, assuming that you have a basic no basic deficiencies. Though that's one of the beauties of the free essential amino acids; they don't have to be digested; they are immediately absorbed in the same way that glucose is absorbed so that they're 100% effective without adding any additional compounds. Now, there are, there are, as you get older, specific things that we uh, have to worry a little bit about. One of the most recently observed uh, issues has been uh, that most people, as they get older, uh, aren't taking in enough vitamin D, that the vitamin D requirements are probably low. And zinc is an important component of uh, of the diet, which is uh, a problem if you're eating a vegan diet. So I think that, that uh, you know, what you're asking is a complicated thing and why I, I, I sort of cover it by saying you need a normal diet that has all the basic nutrients and that given that basic diet, you don't need anything more to take advantage of the, the beneficial effects of free essential amino acid formulations. If you're deficient in other nutrients as well, then you need to really address that defi those deficiencies at, at the same time because uh, uh, that will impair the effectiveness of whatever else you're eating. Great. So what you're really saying is that these essential amino acids, you know, such as what you produce, are a really great addition to the diet and for helping people but we also have to make sure that we eat a nutrient dense diet with you know with all the other vitamins and minerals and trace elements because they're all essential for exactly as well. for, for sure and I, I i think that that's really an important message because uh uh i think we're we're not trying to uh say this is a a uh, a new diet that this is all you eat uh and i think that uh I think that, uh, of course, everything I say has to do with older people. And of course, probably my age has a lot to do with that, but I do work at a geriatrics clinic. And I think the other thing that we wanna also maintain is uh, the social aspect of eating meals and uh, that you're relying on, on meals uh, to provide not just uh, nutrition, but also uh, social uh, activity and pleasure. And that, uh, that eating a, a nutrient stent diet is, uh, you know, all part of that. And, uh, and that that's why the essential amino acids should be looked at as essential, but a, a, an extra component, which really enables you to benefit more from your uh, dietary intake, as well as the uh, activity that you might be doing. So I want to be respectful of your time and we're getting close to our, getting close to our hour. So my next question is about, you know, we hear all these stories about don't eat too much protein. You alluded earlier to, um, you know, the mechanisms of the reactions or mechanisms needed to um, create muscle protein synthesis, you know, which is like mTOR, having mTOR and, and insulin. And there's a lot of talk these days about don't increase your mTOR because, you know, it's, um, going to decrease your life and 
there are a lot of other myths as as well about protein causing cancer, kidney problems, um, heart disease, diabetes. Can you just speak briefly to to those? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the biggest problems as an experimentalist has been the uh, the reliance on epidemiological type studies to uh, to define some of these issues that you've just been alluding to, because. Uh, when you look at the, the, a lot of these uh, perceptions of the so-called uh, detrimental effects of dietary protein, then you have to consider that regardless of what the statistical procedure, you can't dissociate that from uh, other activities or, or lifestyle events. And uh, one of the things that is true enough, and that is that people are so, at least in the United States, are so inundated with the fact that you're eating too much protein that someone that says the heck with it, I'm going to eat whatever I want to eat and eat more and eats more protein, maybe doing other activities as well that aren't optimal, that in fact aren't optimal for body, uh, for, for longevity. Uh, the reality is that of all those things you just ticked off, they're the experimental data where, where um, outcome studies have been done a priori, meaning that you start with everybody in the same place and give some higher levels of protein, some lower levels of protein. In fact, rather than being a problem, all of them have actually been shown to be benefiting, benefited from dietary protein. So that um, the National Academy of Science, as well as the FAO, both concluded that, that, that it's not known if there's any upper limit of safe intake, but that as much as 30% of your dietary intake of, diet, of protein has been shown to be totally safe and actually enhance uh, response uh, of these variety of uh, uh, potential issues. Uh, the only one that's a little bit of concern is, is if you have any kidney function problems. Uh, the high, high uh, dietary protein has never been shown to cause kidney problems, but uh, that a high protein intake in an individual who has kidney problems may create problems with the terms of excess urea and ammonia production. And that's one of the reasons that we use the essential amino acids because what the essential amino acids do is stimulate protein synthesis and the reincorporation of the non-essential amino acids that normally would be going to produce urea and ammonia, they're reincorporated back into protein so that we actually get a drop in urea production when taking essential amino acids. And so that's a, an important twist because if you do have renal problems that a higher protein intake may uh, create some issues. Other than that, in terms of cardiovascular, uh, the only uh, basis for that would be non-protein component of the uh, protein food source. And even that is very questionable. There's studies, uh, for example, in beef intake, which uh, uh, which suggests that really there's no limitation and that, that we should probably be reassessing the, the so-called risk of too much uh, saturated fat. But those are, those are issues that uh, you're probably better versed than I am. It's not my particular area of expertise, but, uh, but I do think it's important to recognize that, that high protein per se has never been shown to cause any of the problems that you just alluded to, despite the fact that we hear on a daily basis. In fact, in the clinical nutrition unit where I've talked to many people that have said, well, I'm cutting my, and this is at the geriatric center, cutting my dietary protein intake down. And I ask them, well, why? And, it's, and they'll respond uniformly for my health. So that uh, this is a, a real concern to me that, that somehow mm -hmm. that we've uh, gotten into this state where People think that we're eating too much dietary protein where there's really not a shred of data to support that perception. And in fact, the problem is much more so to be likely that they're not eating enough dietary protein as opposed to uh, too much dietary protein. Well, there's concerns about cancer as well. Have you, do you have any comments about that, that protein? Yeah, we've done studies in cancer and this goes back years ago to the uh, early 1980s when uh, uh, it came, became possible to feed people through uh, tubes put into the, uh, through the nose into the uh, intestine because uh, it's obvious with cancer, the, uh, the food intake 
goes down and people get wasted and, and that that seems to be a major factor in, in being able to complete uh, treatment through both uh, radiation therapy as well as uh, chemotherapy. But the concern was always, well, we don't want to feed the cancer by giving them uh, excess protein and amino acids because that'll stimulate their growth and, uh, as you said, the mTOR and the protein synthesis. But what has become clear over the years is that the metabolic priority, that cancer cells are a metabolic priority in the body. And if you don't give enough protein in the diet, then the muscle is going to break down and provide the amino acids. And that's why you get this great loss, our so-called catabolic response or cachexia of uh, protein, because the muscle is being eaten away to provide the amino acids to fuel the metabolism of the uh, of the uh, uh, cancer cells, you're not going to, the study after study has shown you're not going to, uh, you're not going to slow the cancer growth down by withholding protein, but you will decrease muscle strength and in many cases decrease the ability to have the strength to make it through a full course of radiation or chemotherapy. So it's, 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 one, it's one of these arguments that was made sort of like, well, logically, we don't want to stimulate the growth, but without understanding that the cancer cells have a metabolic priority and they're going to get their nutrition from somewhere. If you don't provide it, it's going to come from the muscle. Mm, that's, and it's a really great point, I think. Um, and, you know, sarcopenia and, you know, this kind of obesity sarcopenia, um, which you allude to in your book, or you, you, you speak about in your book, and I'm, I'm just a bit aware of the time. So I'll, I'll send people to your book to have a read about <laughs> to have a read about that. I was wondering if we could just finish up. I know you have a few thoughts about the environmental aspects of encouraging us not to eat animal proteins. Can you just talk a little bit about, about that um, and what you think about you know, some of those concerns? Well, um, my concern is that there hasn't been an adequate uh, appraisal of the health effects of, de of eliminating animal protein from the diet. That on the one hand, we can calculate how much methane is produced by a cow, but uh, there really has, what, what's really, every attempt that's been shown to, that's been done to try to, to uh, model, can we actually replace all that dietary protein with a, with a, a plant-based diet has shown that it's really not a feasible approach. Uh, but more importantly, which is very difficult to do anything other than speculate about is that we know that decreasing the essential amino acid intake in your dietary protein has negative health effects what those are, how, you know, at what level is that becoming a problem and so forth, uh, aren't really certain, but they have not been taken into account at all in the recommendation that we minimize or eliminate meat as a source of protein. If you think about the environmental aspect, uh, you know, there is nothing more efficient than a cow or a sheep grazing on grass, which is totally inedible for humans and converting that into the highest quality dietary protein. So that the notion that we can easily replace this is really optimistic and ignoring that basic, uh, the, the basic issue. That being said, uh, I, if someone believes in that strongly, that's part of the goal of the essential amino acid supplements because you can sidestep the, the uh, dietary requirement for all the essential amino acids uh, through, uh, through meat and, and uh, uh, animal-based products. But uh, from my own personal perspective, I think that, it, that it would, if you're doing this for an environmental reason, that you really need to look at all of the data, not just the amount of methane that the cow is producing, because uh, there's, a, there's a cost to the environment of, of food intake, regardless of what you uh, uh, choose to eat as the major source of dietary protein. Mm. And, and then I'll just come back to the other um, vitamins and minerals and, and um, you know, micronutrients, which are also essential. And so you end up living on a diet full of supplements. And, yeah, and, and exactly. Well, 
I think that the, uh, the, the idea of red meat is really the uh, uh, epitome of that because particularly as you get older, the red part of the meat is crucial because you need extra iron and you need it in a format that can be absorbed. And uh, you know, the concept that, that red meat in itself is, is a problem is, is just the uh, reverse of what you just said, that it contains nutrients and it's high in zinc and uh, iron and other nutrients that are a crucial part of the diet. And, uh, and unless, like you said, unless you want to just live a, a life of uh, uh, pulling out your dietary pills and, and eating them, then uh, that's a problem. And, and, and it comes back again to the fact that food is really uh, not just nutrient. It is, uh, it's an important part of our lives and uh, uh, eating good food and uh, uh, having fun when you uh, have it as part of special occasions and things like this are, are part of our, uh, of why we enjoy life. And I think that we should never lose sight of that as well. Fantastic. Would you like to just mention your amino acids? People probably would probably be wondering what you would be recommending. I think you've got three or four products. On the yes, table. well, I think that, uh, what I do, since I work out every day, I drink uh, Perform before uh, I work out. And Perform is specifically designed to maintain your energy and focus and uh, synthesis of dopamine relative to serotonin. It has amino acids which stimulate protein synthesis to some extent, but I rely on taking the HEAL product after the exercise, which is more based on uh, specifically uh, repairing damaged muscles and building muscle mass and strength. Uh, the, the product, uh, I don't remember what it's called. I think it's like cleanse. It's uh, uh, a totally different thing, but, but uh, very helpful both in elderly and in uh, people consuming alcohol that uh, the, the uh, development of fatty liver has become a major syndrome that is related to a variety of problems that we've shown we can uh, cut in half by taking the, this uh, liver support system. And finally, the one that, I, that really was the, the basis for a lot of the work that followed was LIFE, which is predicated on the exact formulation designed for older individuals to maintain a, a physical function and uh, you know, an overall balance of, uh, of intake. So, so if you're not working out uh, rigorously and you're over 60 years old, I'd recommend the LIFE. If you have uh, uh, either obese or uh, regularly consuming alcohol, I would recommend the cleanse to target the liver. And if you're working out, the uh, Perform is an ideal formulation for pre-workout and the Heal is a, a, an ideal uh, source for recovery from exercise as well as any other we, we've shown recovery from hip hip replacement and other types of major surgery is enhanced with heel as well so that that, that really is the, the formulation that's based on building up or restoring uh, deficient muscle or damaged muscle well thank you so much there's so many more questions <laughs> oh god could ask you but no, we can try you know we can come back and revisit it if you uh get oh, some feedback I, with questions i'd be happy to do that i would really love that maybe when you get back from your trip to the states um, yeah that'll be fine i'd be happy to i love talking about the subject you know as i said my goal in this stage of my life is to uh make people aware of what the facts are and let them decide how, you know how to move forward but uh to try to try to eliminate as much disinformation as possible. And, and so I'm happy to do this. It's been fun. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. So just to remind everybody, um, Dr. Wolf has his book, which is about the ease program. And if you go onto his website, onto the amino acid website, you'll get a little free um, PDF download with some, some basic information as well, which may be really helpful. And I'll make sure I put all this information in the show notes for everybody. And I'll book you again to come on when you get back from your trip to the States. I'll be most grateful okay. for that. Thanks Thank you. you so much for your time today. Sure thing. So long.